how's it going guys uh this is Kizzer. It's been a while since we've done the podcasts, but it's exciting. This is exciting. I mean, you can see me. So, I mean, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see me. If you're hearing this, it's going to be no difference. But we're doing a video version of this podcast. Uh, I'm really excited because it's the first one. Uh, we found like stuff that made it like really uh, easy to do. Uh, and if you guys are interested in doing something like this or want to know something like this, then uh, just let me know, make a video about like what we kind of did because it's pretty exciting. And I hope that like more people do stuff like this more. Uh, but this episode, I think it's episode 10. I believe if I'm wrong, um, someone's going to correct me. But we have uh, John, John on the podcast. Hey, John, introduce yourself. Hey, how's it going, guys? My name is John Dang. I'm a filmmaker in New York, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Kizzer. So, appreciate it. I'm happy to be on your first video one, too. That's cool. So, yeah, it is. Honestly, like, yeah. uh, through this process, it just made me want to, like, push further and just start streaming it. Uh, because I'm doing yeah. all of this on OBS. So I'm just like, hey, I instead of pressing that record button, I could just press yeah. that stream button. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's cool. I uh, I like both. I, I do like the the uh, just uh, like podcast. It's, it's it sounds kind of like uh, redundant to say audio podcast. Um, but when when you do have a video podcast, there's only to specify. So it's cool that you I like both. I like seeing like Joe, like Joe Rogan's or other people's podcasts. I like watching the conversation sometimes because you just feel like you're there in the room having the conversation um but i also just like the audio aspect of it too so i'm kind of like you know in the middle of like both i like i think they're mm -hmm. both interesting I, I think what's interesting is i think like clips i'm i'm mm -hmm. a bigger fan of video but i'm when i'm like listening mm -hmm. to like a full podcast it's just easier to listen to it right yeah. like um because there's so many like times where like and I guess most people like would like listen to podcasts when they're traveling or when they're like yeah. uh, driving. None of that stuff's happening. But uh, but like, you know, when they're running or doing something like that, that's when like most people like, you know, be like, oh, I'll listen to uh, so and so's podcast. Um, but it it is interesting, um, like just just the difference in like engagement, especially after the the coronavirus and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How's it? Are projects picking back up there? Well, you guys are going back in kind of like a. Are, are you in a yeah, lockdown again? Yeah, yeah. So no? we're we're okay. back in a lockdown. Um, it was turning mm -hmm. out really great for a while, for like a little bit. We yeah. We, we were doing num like at the start we were doing numbers like five hundred cases a day or something like that. Um, okay. And then yeah, and and then we dropped all the way down to like eighty. Uh, and it looked like it was going to be like it was going to keep dropping down. But I think that like mm -hmm. uh, the numbers going down and like people going outside kind of ca caught up to everyone. And then it started pushing up. And now we're at like fifteen hundred a day. Um, okay. Right. It's more than ever. And then all of a sudden it's just a lockdown. I think right now they're saying it's to like the 21st of December. But I imagine it's going to go on longer than that or it should anyways. Probably. Yeah, there was this interesting thing that I had read up on because um, it was good here for a while, too. But um, there was this thing called like they were talking about pandemic fatigue mm -hmm. where people worked. Some people didn't work hard, but other people worked really hard to stay safe, social distance, stay home, things like that. And eventually it gets to a point where, you know, there's that period where, OK, things are getting better, mm -hmm. like we're good. We can kind of like go do more. And then all of a sudden, colder weather comes, flu season's approaching, and then people are being more lax. So it's like a combination of all these different factors that it was an, a second wave. I, like I've always just been saying, like since the first one was inevitable, I feel like some places are actually in their third wave. Like the U.S. is considered in its third wave, mm -hmm. but certain cities like New York and other places are in their second. It's just all like it, it fluctuates from place to place. But yeah, it was kind of it was nice uh, to get back out there and shoot. I was shooting more. Um, and now I just feel like I, mean, I can still shoot mm -hmm. it. We're not on lockdown. We have like curfews for like, you know, restaurants and bars mm -hmm. and stuff. So people are still doing stuff, but I'm afraid that I, ho I, ho I hope it doesn't like start to come down a little bit more hard on like, you know, governing laws when it comes to like the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. It's, I've, like, it's, it's interesting. Cause you said pandemic fatigue 
And for some reason, I yeah. thought you were saying people were tired about hearing about the pandemic. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's just like because like even I. Did, so, dude, I was wearing gloves, uh, mask everywhere. I would I had this whole system like what to do with the laundry, what how to dispose of all my stuff. It was like I treated it like a laboratory, yeah. uh, my day to day life, how I would touch things. And now it's just OK. I walk outside, I wear my mask, I germex, and then I go to where I have to go. But now I feel like I'm going to have to get back into that habit of wearing gloves oh, and doing all this other it, stuff. It was the same thing here. Um, like, I, I live with my parents and stuff, right? And so what we would do, uh -huh. and before things got better and before the second wave kind of hit for us was, we would like, whenever we'd bring groceries, we would like, like, we'd wash every, because right at the entrance mm -hmm. the garage entrance there's like this like big sink so we'd bring everything yeah. there and we'd wash everything and any, anything plastic we'd wash with soap um uh, and uh and all the fruits and stuff i mean obviously we'd wash it but there's there are certain things that you just can't wash with soap right so you just like yeah. sometimes you just things that you can let sit out in the garage for like a few days you you that's what mm -hmm. we would do but now it's like oh do we need to use this okay just leave it in the garage for a few days mm -hmm. like that's all we're doing yeah. um there's other things that like we're like, like for instance, we have bagged milk. We don't have cartons because uh, I know most other places have cartons. So what we would do, like our milk. You say bagged yeah, milk? Yeah. It's been bagged. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So like the the way our milk is is like it's like this like large two liter. It, I think four liters it comes in. Uh, like like this bag and inside there's like three other bags. Um. And so essentially you have like this carton, you put the milk in the carton, you cut it, and then you kind of pour pour out like that. Um, but I feel like I'm explaining. <laughs> no, that's interesting. No, I never even heard of that. I didn't know you could get uh, milk in bags. I was, uh, that's, yeah, I, I, I thought they were doing water like that too at some point. Yeah. I don't know. Like some people were doing like bagged water. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't uh, like, yeah. Uh, but the point is like what we do is like, when we bring the milk, we take the bags out, like in, the inside bags out immediately, and we just throw the outside bag, uh, yeah. because that's the thing that's like interacted with the most with people. So there's yeah. stuff like that that we were doing, but like we were going a lot more intense with it before. Like we would we would like wash the inside bags too, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're just like uh, <laughs> one one bag's good. One we're bag's good. good. Just throw this one away. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. The only thing I'm like super strict on right now, I, I do clean all my stuff still, but I don't like when I'm, uh, I've been eating out less because I've noticed um, people aren't really, when it comes to food handling, like the cashiers taking cash and cards and things like that. And sometimes they're going and touching the food and I, and without washing it, I'm like, oh no, I don't even like that pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, like, so I think like, that the one thing that's different um or at least it was different, um, was like, I think the culture around the pandemic was very, is very different, uh, in, at least in my circles or like the people that I interact with that are Canadian versus American. Uh, and I'm saying like people that are, even that I know that are like family, like that are like I have family in Texas and a few other places in, in the States. And every time we talk to them, they'd be like, yeah, no, it hasn't even come here. And this was before it had, it had come there. Uh, right. It's like, no, it's, it's, it's all relaxed here. And then it's like, and now when you look at it, it's like t Texas, the numbers are pretty big, at least from what, what, yeah. what, what I, what I know. But I think that that had to do with like just the way uh, Trump was kind of, uh, talking about it, right? And yeah. it's really interesting because if you go to like uh, the, because I know before we started the podcast, we were talking about like Joe Rogan and um, and or those those in the podcast. Anyways, he he had, he had a podcast with um, with Chappelle, and they were talking about the the pandemic, and they were talking about like. Um, how people are like deal like dealing with it, and because like before they were only saying, "Oh, it's a few weeks. It's it's going to be gone in a few weeks," right? And that's all like, that's not like what people thought. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what Trump was saying. Yeah. And there's like yeah. even video footage of him saying like he knew that wasn't the case, but he's like, "What am I supposed mm -hmm. to tell these people?" Right? Yeah. Uh, it's panic control. Right. And 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 again, I think it's still bad panic control. It is a hundred percent. You can't, that's a, that's, that's too misleading. You know, there's certain, if you don't understand certain things, that's okay. Like you can do panic control that, that way. But if you know something is going to have longevity, 
people need to be prepared. It doesn't matter if they're that's, scared. That's the, like, that's the epitome of like human nature, which is like mm-hmm. we're going to deal with thing that's gonna, something that's going to like be the most efficient oh. right now, but it's going to do a lot of harm in the future. Right. Where it's like Absolutely. saying something like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be gone in a few weeks. OK, like if you're listening, if a normal person is listening to that. Right. Mm-hmm. And does it like regardless of their opinions of Trump, it's like, OK, I can sit down. For, I can chill, like, you know, hold back for a few weeks. Right. Mm-hmm. But what that does long term, it's like two, three months down the line. It's like I don't trust what anyone's saying anymore about it. It's not even it's it's not only that. It's also uh if you if the, I tell you something and you're preparing for it for three four weeks at most a month and a half, and then four months goes by, you lost a month and a half of preparation to allocate things that you need for your life to secure certain things to make extra money if you need it, um, because you were preparing for something far less worse and now something way worse came oh, no. and it it was long. yeah 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 hundred percent and. But but going like but going to like the the panic version of that, I think that like yeah. like once they stop believing in what you're saying, you have no control mm-hmm. anymore. You don't you don't because it's like the boy who cried wolf. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, you 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 lie to someone multiple times, your words lose value. Mm-hmm. You know, then you just start to see, you you will seem not seem but you will be untrustworthy to people. It's like if you keep telling us something, you keep saying something, and it. It ends up being the opposite. It's just you automatically lose that. That's why, you know, people that I, uh, you know, I followed or that I communicated with constantly posting uh, bias, like weird, uh, non-factual information about the virus, about politics, about all that stuff that come from Instagram memes that have no merit or value. And they're passing it off constantly mm-hmm. as like truth. And it's like, it just takes one or two times for you to do that. If it's mm-hmm. and, then, and then I'm just like, <laughs> anything else you say about anything mm-hmm. is gone. Like it's one ear out the other. Like I don't care what you have to say because if you are unable to just research for a second on Google, just quickly. I'm not saying like pick the first headline and then run with it. But I mean just like really just like it doesn't take that long. You can figure out what's true and what's not. Mm. I, th- yeah, like, I think that speaks to a larger problem of social media in general. Right. And I think that like we just didn't see ramifications of the bad side of social media where it would it's affecting lives as much as we are now. Right. Like like something someone said about like, oh, if you do this, this happens. Right. Or if you try coconut oil, like it's actually going to grow your hair. It's like, oh, I tried it and I did it and nothing happened. It's like, OK, now I can move on with my life. But it's like now they're like, oh, the pandemic's actually gone. It's like if I step outside, I can get it right. Like that's actually affecting yeah. this, actually affecting yeah. it. Right. So I think like now we're seeing like stuff like that has existed from like mm-hmm. forever because it's like, oh, it's instant clicks. It's instant shares and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um and you know we we all experienced most of the pandemic and the virus through uh, from March. You mm-hmm. know what I mean. Some other places were afflicted in the winter, um, but and as far as New York, our lockdowns began mid March. So you have spring and you have summer, and then you have going into fall. That wasn't like so the like viruses naturally just don't last much longer on surfaces outside uh, during like the heat. So when Trump excuse me, Donald, when Donald heard that, he ran with it. He's like, oh, it's summer. The virus, the virus is going to get killed. It's like, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, but like what we're saying is that it last, its lifespan is less. Um, so we had the privilege of experiencing all of that. And I say privilege in a weird way because it, was, it, didn't, it wasn't a privilege, but of going through all that during those um, other seasons. But now mm-hmm. winter, losing it, we didn't go through it yet. Mm-hmm. We didn't go through it in uh, November, December quite yet in the States and in Canada. It was mostly in, in China. Um, so I don't know, man, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to take up. No, no. And a hundred percent. And that's kind of like, I, I, would, I didn't want to segue into like, let's, yeah. um, so for the people that like, don't really know about you, right? Like tell, mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about yourself. Like kind of, uh, what are you kind of working on? Where'd you kind of, um, mm-hmm. get into like the film scene and all that other stuff? 
you should all know who I am. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so my name is John. Uh, if you see me online, it's X-H-O-N, and uh, the X-H in my language is, uh, it's John, it's a J. It, it's pronounced as a J, so it's just John. Um, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I've been, I've been doing this for quite some time. I uh, started out making, like, those silly Lego stop-motion videos with my VH, my parents' VHS mm-hmm. uh, camcorder. And actually, my dad found them. He sent me a bunch of videos, which I thought would be cool to, like, kind of, like, cut back to sometime in the future. Maybe kind of, like, leading into, like, a huge project as, like, a teaser opening, mm-hmm. like, showing, like, a timeline or something. Um, so, yeah, I started when I was about, like, 12 or 13. I, I, I caught the bug of, like, creating because I've been drawing since I was like five and I've been like an artist like pretty much my whole life since a child like I always day dreamt it was terrible in school mm-hmm. uh, because I didn't like uh, I, I couldn't but I just was constantly drawing and daydreaming and like drawing mm-hmm. like comics uh, when I was supposed to be like doing math and mm-hmm. stuff um, and just one one thing led to another and you know I just started working on projects and fell in love with it um, been freelancing for over a decade now, um, not full time the entire decade. The first time I was getting my feet wet, had to work different jobs mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, and then I moved to New York uh, at the beginning of this year, um, fortunately and unfortunately. So I've been traveling to New York um, about once a month, every other month for quite some time. And then I just decided to uh, pull the trigger and just move here full time uh, in January, packed up my car and drove, uh, didn't really. It's funny because I was actually talking to Patrick about this. Um, I didn't tell anybody. I just, I, I kept that a secret mm-hmm. from literally my entire hometown and everybody I knew with the exception of like my family and a couple people, mm-hmm. but not because like I was worried about what anyone would say or like, Oh, why are you moving? Um, there's this interesting thing a psychologist said about like activating the reward center of your brain by talking too much. Um, and like, if you, speak out into existence like certain it's it's okay like to say things that you want to do but doing it too much or talking about it too much i was worried that i wouldn't make it happen if i just kept doing it and talking about it and then you get high off of the feeling of thinking about Mm -hmm. it and then it never comes to fruition so i was like no i just got to play this one close to the chest so i doubled down i didn't really go anywhere i worked bought a new car um and packed it up and then drove to new york uh, because i wanted to grow uh in new york in in my hometown it's great i love my city right jackson i grew up there i was a my family and i were refugees um moved to florida when i was two months old um and then yeah i grew up there where's your family from but albania and uh so our most of my family is uh, albanian greek and there's some italian Mm -hmm. yeah so it's a it's a mixture Mm -hmm. of all of it um so yeah i moved to new york this year because I wanted to, uh, I saw the ceiling in my hometown. You right, know what I mean? Right, like when you see the right. ceiling and this quote by Tarantino really hit me because he was like, if you can, you can be the fastest, like with all the people around you, you could be the fastest one, number mm-hmm. one. Um, and you're going to win every single time. But if you move to a place where everybody's faster than you, you may lose every single time. But what's going to happen is you're going to get faster because they're faster and it pushes you to be faster. And then eventually you can be the fastest, Mm -hmm. hopefully, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really like that analogy that he used in terms of like filmmaking and his craft because, you know, I'm in the same thing. I'm filmmaking my craft. I saw the ceiling. I started to get faster than a lot of the people there. I was like, ah, you know, like there's, I got to go. You know what I mean? I have to go. Um, And honestly, even like I've had a better experience here through a virus afflicting the world and my city um, than I did in a normal era in my hometown. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's like, um, yeah, that was like the biggest push for me is I got to change the scene. I got to be in a more active city because naturally when there's where there's more opportunity, yes, there will be more work. If you actually build your portfolio if you have, you know, if you're ready and hungry to work, mm-hmm. if you go out there and meet people and things like that, it's it's inevitable. Um, if you're just starting out and you go to a new big city, it, it you know, mm-hmm. it's a little bit harder, but you can still do it. You know what I mean? It's like, but you still have to build your portfolio and you know, get your credentials. Um, so yeah, that was that was the biggest push for why I wanted to move here. And um, you know, my aspirations with filmmaking are to make feature films. Mm-hmm. So 
Uh, I still lo- I, I love the David Sandberg approach. You know what I mean? He did a few yeah. short films with his wife. Yeah, yeah. I love that guy. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and you know, he made a couple things. Sorry, repeat that. So, you 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 cut off for a second. Oh, did we cut off? I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> just, I was basically just saying that uh, David Sandberg is like yeah. I, I really love his approch yeah, yeah. to the filmmaking and how he does the craft. And and what's really interesting is that Tarantino kind of uh, line. Uh, I've I've heard that before, uh, and I've I've like I've seen it firsthand uh, in high school. I went from one high school to another, and my friend group in one high school, like I think, I, because I mean, in high school for me was all about like you know marks and getting the best uh, average and all that other stuff, right? Like I probably had like the third or f- like the third best average, right? But it was like most people were around me. Do you know what I mean? Like in my in my group, like there was one, maybe one, like one or two, like really smart people. Uh, but it was like I had like a like a seventy eight, which is like a like a B plus, like average. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, like I, I I can live with this. Like this is the norm. But then when I yeah. moved, like all my friends, like they were really smart, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And like like I had a friend that like did four years of computer science, got ninety nine, ninety nine, ninety nine, ninety nine. Uh, Fantastic. Right. And like he's working in Facebook right now. Um, yeah. And, that's really smart. <laughs> and, and and like I know a lot of those kind of people. That's like kind of like a lot of the people that I grew up in in, in the second high school. But like my average in the, then was like mid 80s. Mm-hmm. Right. It It's very like it became very real where it's like, oh, like we're all like in our spare time trying to figure out like what, what, what like what were the questions on the math test that were asked from everyone in the first period it's like right right it's it's we're all trying collectively to do something and it becomes very real right like right. that's like for instance like if you met, like with everyone that we know and now the discord right patrick's discord it's like we're all seeing people do really cool stuff so it kind of makes mm-hmm. you like be like I need to get a camera. I need to sh- go sh- go shoot some stuff. It's it's honestly healthy competition. It's good, yeah. you know, having that type of circle and ecosystem. I always tell people if your environment sucks, whether that's people or the place, change it. Um, I don't really like the mentality of oh, I hate this city. You know, it sucks. I want to move because then I've noticed with some a lot of people that talk like that. I'm like, it doesn't matter where you move your attitude stinks you know what i mean so it's like but yes sometimes there are better opportunities because we were talking about mm-hmm. it yesterday you know mm-hmm. what i mean i think that in today's age mm-hmm. moving becomes less and less important like moving is always really important right like yeah. like if if i'm if i'm working in downtown toronto versus like like somewhere a lot further away mm-hmm. there's going to be like things that i that i miss but yes. more and more today right with how like online social media is right it's like uh and that was part of like a big thing that someone said about the podcast was uh someone said something and this really really hit they're like if you really want to work with someone right and you're really trying to meet them and you're like hey let's grab a coffee Mm -hmm. they might say yes they might they, they might say yes, you might grab the coffee, you might know them. But if you're like, but there's a good chance where they say no, because they don't really see anything coming out of that conversation. You know? mm-hmm. But if you could be like, hey, you want to come on my podcast? There's a much bigger chance that they say yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like one of those things where it's like, oh, I should start a podcast not to get big, but because it's such a great networking tool. It right? is. Right. Like I've met filmmakers because like on the podcast because it was such an easier way to be like, Hey, do you want to come on my podcast versus like, Hey, can we just talk? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a conversation. That's all. There's like, it's just like you were like, well, I'm having a coffee. You're having a coffee. The biggest difference is, is being recorded. We can have our conversation, but at the same time, if you have something you want to say or share, or, you know, you want an audience to connect with you, you have that, mm-hmm. you know, so there is more lure for you. I'm the, t- I would do either. I'm the person's like, Hey, you want to meet up for a cup of coffee? Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Hey, you want to meet up on the podcast? Let's do it. You know, so it's <laughs> like, um, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And, um, and it just becomes really interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. but that also, also brings up the fact that I'm kind of curious. So yeah, you were, uh, you were in Jackson, you said? Jacksonville. Jackson, Florida. Florida. Um, mm-hmm. 
how many years in your like filmmaking career were you there? Um, so a lot of my filmmaking and like just working on projects was trial and error, testing, messing around, like just making literally stupid things just to practice. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about cameras, like even my, fr- so I went from the VHS to the Sony camcorder. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, dad, this is the one, this is the camera. <laughs> it was not the camera. <laughs> Oh my god um and then and then i, I went to the the t2i i rocked the t2i mm-hmm. man for like six years 2010 to 2016 mm-hmm. um when i first got that i was like oh my god look at this blurry background because <laughs> i had the the 50 the nifty 50 i was like oh wow i, I had the t3i <laughs> with the nifty 50 so oh, I, did you I, yeah yeah that's a lot of like the t2i to t4i is a like entry level filmmaker for most people yeah. like it's, as far it's as tools. and before you continue it's really interesting yeah. because i the person i bought the t3i off of is uh, uh i had him on my podcast um i bought him i bought it off like a like a craigslist we have kgg right um uh-huh. so I, I and he now sh- was shooting for the toronto raptors Oh, wow. okay. So I had him on the podcast right after the Raptors won. And it was just really interesting to see like how careers kind of like, you know, yeah. progress and kind of go. Yeah. One, one thing can lead to another for sure. Um, but yeah, so, um, filmmaking career, I would say, so I took a graphic design course, which actually in, in high school, which led me to meet my mentor, um, became a really good friend of mine. Um, and then he kind of like, he was like my biggest motivator when it came to like pursuing my craft. He's like, just constantly boasting me of like my hype man. He was my hype man. He's like, dude, you're really good. I was like, nah, he's like, you're really good. And he just kept like every day, you're really good. Just kept hyping me up. Yeah. And then, um, unfortunately he was killed like two days, you know, before my birthday. And after that, I just kind of went, went through this like weird period where I didn't really like want to make anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so after, you know, it took, it took some time, but, you know, like working on projects, um, I knew that's what I want to do. I, I think around like 2000, like 11, 2010, I was like, I want to pursue this as a career that like as a career, not just as like a hobby and making stuff. So I, you know, for the past 10 years, I would say I've been in my pursuit, you know, my journey, you know, staying on brand of your, your podcast, how'd you get there? So it's like, um, you know, worked on a few things here and there. I, I was doing like, tried the whole like YouTube skits, sketches and comedies, uh, emulating college humor, Mm -hmm. things like that, Mm -hmm. other types of YouTube channels. But then I realized it wasn't really for me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some people say I'm comedic and I'm funny, but like at the same time, it it required a lot of energy that I wasn't willing to like give. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, then I kind of somehow transitioned into both digital marketing, web design, things like that. while also doing content creation, video production and stuff. So that around 2014, it was like, it it was basically like full time, like for the most part, um, it was some dips in here and there, you know, I had to do like a couple jobs and stuff like that. But for the past like six, seven years, been doing it quite some time. Um, I just cut off digital marketing this year, you know, I don't really want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like when you're, when you have so much going on and you're doing things because you're talented at it or you can do it, Mm -hmm. you do it because you want it's money. But at the same time, it's like, do you really want to do it? Can you cut it off? I always tell people like, even in filmmaking, it's like, you're doing like all these different tasks. Like what do you really want to do? I'm a director and writer at heart. I don't want to be a cinematographer and I don't Mm -hmm. want to be an editor Mm -hmm. Mm long-term. I think, you are the same way. I, I feel like you will shoot if you have to, but realistically, you want to delegate mm-hmm. that to others. You want to be mm-hmm. a director and a writer, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. My thing is I I do find pleasure in editing depending yeah. on the project. Like, mm-hmm. And what's funny is I thought, it, I thought I liked editing a lot more than I did. And this happened yeah, when um, – and I love editing. But it has yeah. to be the right project now. Like I won't like, yeah. like for me, I need to like I I love editing in the sense that like if it's my project, I like I'm always down to edit it. Like yeah. I, I I love it in that sense. Like I'm not like damn I have to edit this. Like yeah. the part I don't like about editing is like the syncing is the organization <laughs> is yeah, yeah, yeah. right. It's like yeah. there's tedious stuff there, but that's like 
that's what an assistant editor and that's what assistant editors and stuff like that is for, right? Like that's why there's a hierarchy there, right? Sure. Um, but if if someone has like a good project, I'm always like like I don't mind like editing even if it's just for fun. Like I have fun when I edit, right? Yeah. And that's kind of where I kind of live in that sense too. It's like uh, I can be good at something, but am I having fun doing it? Right. Like I, I was making a lot of these like experimental YouTube videos and I was doing it cause it was fun. And I'm like, you, that's kind of like the mindset where it's like, it doesn't, you don't need to like, it'd be great if a whole bunch of people watched it, but mm-hmm. you need to be able to do what you're doing and like also just enjoy it f- for the sake of doing it. Right. If you're not enjoying it, then what the hell, right. you know, like, like, it's so like sometimes people are like, um, like I don't even like doing a lot of freelance corporate stuff, but the thing is that some jobs paid 5,000, mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. paid 2,000 and it was money. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So people are like, Oh man, like you're really blessed to like do like all these like videos and work on projects with clients and get paid for it. I was like, yes. And like, it's yes and no for me personally. Um, is it is a blessing to pick up my camera, use my craft to make a living. But I was, I had a long conversation with my buddy about it. Cause he was, we were both kind of in a similar mindset at the time. And we were like, so we both came to the like enlightened, like we were enlightened that we we started this as filmmakers and somewhere along the line, we were like, okay, we can be corporate commercial filmmakers and freelancers and make money off of this until we make our movies. But that wasn't the goal. Like, I don't want to go shooting CEOs of companies or conducting interviews and things like that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like. I do it because I can, because I know lighting, because I shoot, I edit, I'm a director and things like that. But that is something that I picked up along the way to pay the bills. Cause at least you're, oh, excuse me, at least you're in the ecosystem of video production. You are getting better at your craft. And because of that, there, so there's pros and cons. You're getting better at your craft. You're learning different angles and shooting, getting better at lighting. You're using money to buy more gear. You're investing in yourself. So being a freelance video production professor professional is different than being a filmmaker. So I like sometimes like you have the term videographer. Mm-hmm. I don't call myself a videographer. I say that to clients because that's the term they They're no. understand. Yeah. They're not going to type in filmmaker NYC in Google. They're going to type in videographers near me or video production company or things like that. So there is a difference between being a videographer and being a filmmaker. A filmmaker is a filmmaker. Um, but a videographer is also a filmmaker, but it's like it's its own niche. Um, and along the way, like I've been doing that and I like to your point where you're like, I love editing when it's the project. Hmm. I, I cannot tell you, I do not like editing most of the stuff that I edit. Mm -hmm. I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't find it. And that's what it is. Like when I shot that, like, test short film i was here in this office testing my mm-hmm. lighting right the mm-hmm. vigil the short film mm-hmm. with the orange and mm-hmm. the green lights i you could not pull me away from the computer mm-hmm. i would edit mm-hmm. you, if the project is right i will sit down for 20 30 mm-hmm. 40 hours mm-hmm. i'll sleep for 30 minutes mm-hmm. and get back up and edit if it's a project i don't like mm-hmm. i will sleep for 30 hours mm-hmm. <laughs> get up for five minutes mm-hmm. you know what yeah, i mean it's, so it's, uh, when i did my first big sci-fi short um uh-huh. we finished it it was a four-day shoot and literally and it like it's like like narrative productions are so insane in the sense that yeah. like it's like literally usually four four hours of sleep like 12 to 15 hour days for like how many every days and at the end of that i should have been sleeping the next day but I got up and I finished the edit in like three days uh, nice. for like a short. So you're, you're on fire, yeah, man. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm into this. I want to see how it looks. I want to see how the footage looks. Yeah. Like what happens is like we were talking about getting potentially another editor. Um, and I'm like, all right, all right. And I'm like, okay, I want to see how this scene looks together. And then I'm like, yeah. hey, let me add that. Let me add the next scene. And let me add the next scene. Okay, let me add the it's scene before this. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're done. It's like it's oh, like, feature film done in three days. You know, no, no, it, it, yeah. it was like a, it was like a. No, I, know. Yeah. I was just like, that'd be funny if it was like a feature. It's like you're done, Kizzer. It's like yeah, no, no. it's finished. Like we're having a screening today. <laughs> it's funny because I, 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 I messaged the producer and I'm like, uh, are you guys uh, still looking for an editor? Because I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, um, I completely agree, man. It's uh, 
who said it? Ryan Connolly probably said it on film, right? That's probably where I picked this mm-hmm. up from. But you make your film three times. Mm-hmm. You write it, you shoot it, and then you edit it. Mm-hmm. And I've yeah, it, it's changed from script to shooting and from shooting to editing. Like you literally do make it three times. So from a filmmaker's perspective, it is extremely enjoyable to go through the entire process from start to mm-hmm. finish. There isn't a process of filmmaking that I, I found that I do not enjoy. Mm-hmm. I love screenwriting. I love cinematography when it comes to filmmaking, narrative filmmaking. I love uh, directing. I love being a grip or gaffer. I, I, I've been a PA. I love um, just the entire experience. I would love to even um, dabble with uh, set design and building like scenes like because I have a construction background with my family, construction mm-hmm. and real estate, flipping homes. I would love to build sets and scenes. That's why I did all that for the short scene vigil because I wanted to like – I would have gone more all out if I had more time, but uh, stuff there is there is no process in filmmaking that is not enjoyable to me. Like I am completely electric from start to finish. Um, video production, clients, I can't say the same. Um, and I try my best to. I I do deny projects. I have denied some, and even some like we're, we're paying fine because I'm doing people a favor by denying them if I'm not passionate about it because it's like, listen, <laughs> I don't tell them this, but it's like, I don't care about this. You know what I mean? Cause I don't want to disrespect anybody, mm-hmm. but it's like, if I don't care, I just, it's going to reflect. Mm-hmm. It will reflect in my energy. It will reflect in, you know, my work product probably because I'm just not electric about it. Mm-hmm. And I want to, everything that I do, everything that I touch, I want to be on fire, passionate about and electric. Mm-hmm. I don't, because otherwise, what's the point? Like I started as a kid, mm-hmm. kisser. Mm-hmm. I said, this is what I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I've, to admittedly, I'd be further along if I, um, you know, didn't kind of like, there were, I had periods where I just kind of like, I never stopped or quit or had le- a loss of desire to be a filmmaker, but there were periods, it's called life. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm just going to mm-hmm. summarize and call it life. <laughs> Sometimes life happens and you go through things mm-hmm. and, you know, you, you get sidetracked and you start picking up because I'm one of those people and you, you strike me as the same type of person. Mm-hmm. Aaron strikes me as the same type of person as well, um, where we have like 15, 30 interests and you have to like narrow it mm-hmm. down because mm-hmm. I want to, I want to open a tech company mm-hmm. in my forties or fifties. I'm interested in inventing. Mm-hmm. I love science. Mm-hmm. Like I was a bad student, but it, it's funny because I was a terrible student, but in my adulthood, in my 20s, I studied gravity for fun. I'm up mm-hmm. at 3 a.m. studying mm-hmm. neuroscience, mm-hmm. but my teachers couldn't get me to open up a book mm-hmm. in, in high school mm-hmm. or middle school. So it's like if you're passionate about it, you're going to do it. Like my teachers thought I lacked passion. I didn't. I just lacked their instruction and in what they wanted to do, and I lacked. Mm-hmm. I, I I wasn't passionate about conformity to that. Not to be like the rebel, the cool guy, like the guy in the Breakfast Club, but I just didn't. Like, yeah. I just I like doing my own thing. Yeah. I I was I was the same, but in an opposite manner, in the sense that I was like a great student um, yeah. up till university, and then. Uh, and 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 my thing my thing was always like someone has to teach me. Um, yeah. and in university it was always like, oh, just, I'm going to read off the book and then just go figure it out. Right. And I'm oh, just, so you're more of the, you need the guidance. In the I school? need, my thing was, was like, for instance, in high school, I would mm-hmm. very rarely do homework. Uh, Same. Oh my God. I, but my thing was like, I was lucky or like I was getting like mid to high eighties in mm-hmm. all my classes. Uh, That's good. my thing was like, if someone like kind of went through some I I asked so many questions so many questions and like the moment I got it I don't need to touch it again mm-hmm. right like I remember in university we had like an algebra class which was like terrifyingly hard like we were going into like we were working like doing linear algebra it's been like 11 dimensions um and so it's like st- stuff that you can't wrap your head around right but the moment I got somewhat of an understanding. I went to like failing that class to like mm-hmm. uh, getting 80s past that. Like, I mean, I ended up with like a, like a 70 because it was, I was failing it before, but I'm yeah. like, it, I was that kind of person and just university was never like that. So it was like mm-hmm. one of those things where I'm like, 
um, I can't see myself doing this for four years. Um, and I am yeah. writing so much and I feel yeah. like I just need to commit to this, which also brings me, brings an interesting conversation because you kind of leaned into it a little bit. Uh, and I kind of go back and forth, uh, which is, mm-hmm. I think that like for people that are trying to get into like narrative writing and directing, mm-hmm. I don't like, I don't know how useful video production is. Do you know what I mean? Like, because from my oh, like what I've done in other, like freelance I've, video cause, production cause, cause for clients, I've, I've done the exact mm-hmm. same thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. my thing is, I have multiple interests. I think that if you're mm-hmm. doing video production, that's great for like, oh, you want to make YouTube videos or you want to tell stories on YouTube. Absolutely yes. fantastic because it's it's almost like a one to one translation, right? You're, yes. it, it brings up the exact same points. It's you're getting your equipment, you're getting you're getting used to it, you're building like an work, you're getting money, right? So mm-hmm. with that equipment, then you can go shoot the videos or tell the stories that you want to tell on YouTube, right? Yeah. But mm-hmm. all of my narrative work up to now has like, because because I always thought the same thing where I'm like, okay, well I'm going to get equipment, I'm going to do that, but then I realized, okay, well I'm going to rent the equipment either way. Yeah. Um. I'm going to hire the people. So I need to like, in in order for that to help, instead of doing video production, I need to like go on other people's sets, for instance. Yes. Right. Um, and w- I just kept doing down. I'm like, it's so much. Be- and because video, in my mind, doesn't video production take like a lot of time in the sense that you're like, especially at the start where you're constantly like mm-hmm. looking for work. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, you might need to do cheaper free work. Uh, you, you'll you definitely, like, there's nothing wrong with doing a spec ad. Mm-hmm. During, at the beginning of the pandemic, I um, I took a Prego, a can of Prego, and I shot, like, this overdramatic uh, Prego commercial, a little spec ad. But you can use things in your apartment to build a portfolio to showcase your abilities. Um, so before I go into that, I can, I can come back to that real quick, but before we forget about the point about what you just said about video production, yes, you don't need to shoot a single client video ever to become a filmmaker, a successful one, ever. Mm -hmm. And I wish, I kind of wish I had stuck that route Mm -hmm. of sticking to, a few of my friends have, and some have dabbled with both. They decided, okay, I kind of want to start a company. which I did with a friend of mine in Jacksonville. We started coming. We were doing pretty, we, one client we landed was 10 K a month, Mm -hmm. just one client, you know what I mean? A retainer. Um, so still, I'm still in touch with the guy. I'm in touch with both of them, but we decided, um, the way that it was structured, that it wasn't really conducive for growth. The way we had our company Mm -hmm. video production, it was destined to, to fail. And we, we had the understanding of that it was fine. There was no malice there. Was, we just decided, okay, this probably won't work out. Let's just continue being friends and not do the video production mm-hmm. aspect. But yeah, you don't have to touch a single video production client. You don't have to go out there and hunt. You don't have to be like, I'm a freelancer. You could just stick to writing films and pursuing narrative filmmaking. I have friends that do that. Um, one of them, my friend Drew, he's actually in New York. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know if he does now for years, he didn't have a single piece of gear. Mm-hmm. He would borrow and he would rent, mm-hmm. but he's so talented. He was networking. He was going to, he was putting his film in festivals. He won actually, um, uh, not like the Os. There's like a certain level of Oscars for, for like students or something. I don't mm-hmm. know what, it, but he won one. I don't know if it was for directing or best film. He won one of those doesn't really freelance. He has done some freelancing, but he's mostly focused on filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Another one of my friends, same thing, focused on filmmaking, doesn't really freelance, uh, but dabbles with music videos and things like that. Um, yeah. So to people that are listening to this, if you think like, Oh, I have to start a YouTube channel. Oh, I have to get all this gear. I have to do this and that. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Um, I wish I, sometimes I wish I could go back and not shoot any of these damn client videos Mm -hmm. because all 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 like that you really have to do is just find a consistent job get money and just make shorts till till like someone sees it and goes like "Ooh, that's good do you have anything 
yes. like else, and then and then you just do in, enough of that till 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 you get more eyes and stuff. Yes, there's there's no right or wrong answer. I promise mm-hmm. you. Do you want to go to film school? Go. Do you want not want to go? Don't go. Because even if, like that whole conversation, there's a bunch of people online saying, you know, um, can I swear on here? No, go for it. Go for it. Fuck film school. I, I have I have realized I haven't said a single swear word this whole time. Wow. I'm surprised I haven't collapsed. You know, it's like, you know that meme of like this guy with like his veins bulging out and he's just like screaming? Um, that's me. This one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, but a bunch of people are like, fuck film school, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think there's pros and cons to both. So if there are any younger filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers here listening, um, the benefit of film school is structure. Mm-hmm. And there is, so you can find any, so you can find everything online that you want to know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Everything that's in film school, you can find online, you can get with production experience, but the benefit of film school is there is actually a formal education and structure that will test you and educate you and guide you along the way. You will network with people there and you will cultivate friendships and relationships that you can carry into the filmmaking world. It does prepare you for certain things, and you can be more well-versed as a filmmaker. If you don't go, you have to have the motivation and drive to do it yourself. You have to have the motivation and drive to go on YouTube for 10 hours a day through the night, learning, practicing, failing, going on sets, making your own sets, making your own productions, getting friends and family to help you, things like that. The problem is what I've noticed is from people that are – not well-versed in filmmaking in a formal education sense. This isn't always the case because um, there's the people that break the mold and people that did it on their own. There's the people that decided to do it without film school. There is somewhat of a disconnect from film set etiquette, mm-hmm. lingo, mm-hmm. procedure, mm-hmm. hierarchy, mm-hmm. certain things like that. Mm-hmm. So it can be a little more chaotic And versus the people that have gone to film school and that know this and have been on professional sets. I I've worked with both. I've recently, I shot a music video with a a guy that I met here that I networked with great guy named Jonah. He's a fantastic talented cinematographer. Um, he is very well versed with camera departments, very well versed with, you know, the, the order, like the operations on set etiquette, everything. We just were fluid on set. People are like, um, how, how long have you guys been working with each other? It's like, this is our first set. You know, but we worked that well together. There have been other people that I worked with where no formal it doesn't matter if you have formal education or not, but this was just happened to be the case. Um, less formal education, more, you know, shooting from the hip type thing. It was a little less structured um, with some dips along the way, some oversight, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, that just less less, you know, set control things, mm-hmm. you know, just things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So I've noticed that, yeah, there are pros and cons to both. If, if you have the money or if you are able to go to film school and you think it's going to be good for you, I recommend doing it. If not, I recommend doing the opposite too. So I'm like in the middle mm-hmm. where there's really no right or wrong um, answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in anything. the, yeah, no, what were you saying? I was just saying there's no right or wrong answer for anything for this, for what we were just talking about, video production. You can be a successful filmmaker without owning a single piece of gear. Mm-hmm. I recommend trying to get some gear mm-hmm. if you can, because it does help to be a little more self-sufficient, mm-hmm. but nobody said you can't be an engineer and, or uh, an accountant or some, uh, someone that makes 80 K 90 K 70 K a year where you have evenings and weekends and you can request time off to shoot. Be- but the thing is that doesn't look attractive to most people. They like looking like they're in, completely involved in video production and filmmaking. Mm-hmm. where if you tell them, oh, where do you work? Oh, I'm uh, an accountant at this firm, mm-hmm. but I shoot on the weekends. They're like, oh, okay. But if you tell someone, oh, yeah, I'm a freelancer, and I you know, I work on projects from this and from time to time, and I you know, I work with production companies and stuff, and mm. I, as I'm you know, on films, they're like, oh, that's really cool. But because the non-creative aspect of it, mm-hmm. people are like, they're, they, they think that's like a negative thing, but it's money, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And if... If you are the type of person that will feel like I get like that personally, I would rather take a job that's 80 K a year, a hundred K a year. That's non-creative related with the structure versus accepting a role at a company as a creative director or something else 
that pays far more or even less because I've noticed my uh, when I was doing a lot of digital marketing, my creative capacity was being heavily allocated to my clients. And I was draining my my ability to work on my own stuff. And there seemed to be no structure mm-hmm. in my life. I had to create structure. Mm-hmm. Everything overlapped. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. oh, okay, I wake up at 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. Next thing I know, it's 1 a.m. And I'm working on my client mm-hmm. stuff still. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, 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 yeah. no, no, this is okay. Yeah, I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. you know, it, and, and it kind of plays into, uh, I've had a friend that just, uh, went into film school and he was asking me for advice before as well. And this is what I told him. I'm like, uh, I'm like, the first thing is, is you need to understand yourself, right? Uh, and you need to be able to know how much initiative do I have? Because yes. initiative is just about everything. Like your, your character, um, how hardworking you are, your initiative, all of that is going to kind of be like the center point of everything if you're not in film school, right? And it's stuff like that that you can be a little bit a little bit more laxed on in film school mm-hmm. in the sense like the person that has the most initiative in film school is still going to get probably the most done, right? Because he's going to be yes. going to the most sets. Like st- that stuff's still more important. But the idea is like if you're not in film school, you're like, okay, well, I need to figure out like where, how people are networking, where can I go how do i meet people um where are all the sets how do i get on those sets who do i talk to to get on those sets because none of that stuff exists in film school you can be like you can go to your teachers maybe they're shooting something right because your teachers are likely going to be people that are like in the in the industry if you're you know right right if if you're in like uh in in a film school in a sense right um Mm -hmm. and 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 that all like like the environment is 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 built for you versus you have to build it yourself perfectly said I, I am very interested because we did talk about uh, a little bit about New York and this is something that I'm very interested in because one of the big things for me was before the coronavirus hit, one of my plans was, okay, I'm going to take my short, I'm going to go to to a bunch of festivals and then the whole plan was eventually in the next bunch of years to move out to New York or something like that. Oh, the big apple. The, Kids are in the big apple. 100%. 100%. So, mm-hmm. as someone that's been living in New York for a year, how are you doing it? How are you surviving? How am I surviving? How are you surviving? Barely. Barely? <laughs> no. Um, clinging on by a thread. It's like, it's like um, I'm so basically, all right. Moved here, was working. I was making a good lump sum of money from one client. The agreement with the client was he'll pay me more if I uh, dedicate most of my time to him. Basically, don't accept other clients that conflict with his mm-hmm. area of focus, mm-hmm. or but also that field. So I can still like work on projects and stuff, obviously. You can't dictate my this life. Was, you know? This was uh, before you already moved, or this was after? Did you meet him in New York or – in Jackson. In Florida. In so Florida. I was going to okay. help them expand the company up to New York. Um, so I had already accepted that position because of it. So so my expenses are actually drastically different than what they were in Florida, mm-hmm. right? So I was driving a used car. Mm-hmm. My insurance was cheaper because of it. Mm-hmm. And my rent was a different scenario. Mm-hmm. Go to November 2019, I buy a new car. Mm-hmm. My insurance goes up because of mm-hmm. it. And I moved to New York in a more expensive apartment. Okay. So expenses are different. Um, and I was doing that for four months. And then when the pandemic hit, God, that's such like a widely used phrase now. When, a phrase. When, it's like when the when pandemic, the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're going to reference, reference back to this period as the coronavirus era 100%. or the pandemic or so something. What, what um, were you, and, and, and before we get sidetracked, it is something that someone said that was really fascinating and to think about often, yeah. which is like the pandemic is one of the only things where you can go around the world to anyone and like bring it up and they'll know what you're talking about. 100%. It's like, 100%. where were you during the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. It's Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I got the call. I, I sensed it coming, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't just because of the pandemic. Uh, I had a actually really nice conversation with the guy about it recently. Mm-hmm. So um, it was there was some internal issues amongst other creative departments and team members mm-hmm. that I, I was gently mm-hmm. bringing up respectfully mm-hmm. to them, to their face, mm-hmm. but also to our client because we were all hired to work with this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had noticed a gradual fall off in communication amongst internal team members with me. And I started to feel a little bit shunned out mm-hmm. and I couldn't 
quite understand why. Um, because, well, actually I do, because we have different creative approaches when it comes to branding and marketing. Mm-hmm. I'm really big on brand and, you know, you know, staying top of mind and creating valuable content. They were more in the click funnels, fear tactics type of banner, like, you know, just trying to like be very like tactical about it and like more on a different approach. It was really interesting. I don't know. Um, so eventually I got the call that I knew was coming. So had the conversation March 15th, but then had the conversation like March, like 29th that, um, we couldn't sustain it anymore. They were trying to give me a soft blow saying, oh, it's just because of the virus mm-hmm. and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's not mm-hmm. the virus. <laughs> but, uh, um, so from there, I would just, it, it did give me more time to work on projects, but how, unfortunately. How many months was that? Uh, you were already in New York, right? Yeah, so January, so November. So t- I had worked with this guy before on and off, but like I started working with him again for a better rate. So uh, two months after, November. so two months after you moved to New York. Yes. Okay. January to the beginning of March. Uh, that's when things. So the first week of March, I finished the music video, put it up March 8th or 9th. And then a few days after that, um, that's when we started to go on lockdown. Mm-hmm. So it was like two and a half months. Okay. Um, okay. So two and a half months there. And then from like March 15th to June 15th, like almost on the dot, like 15th to the 15th, um, I didn't go on a single set. Mm-hmm. I didn't go on any sets. Mm-hmm. I couldn't. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I was trying to be very careful, mm-hmm. be very mindful of my health mm-hmm. and other people's health. Um, and you just, nobody was really shooting either. Like they were, but like um, most of the people that I know were being responsible. They're like, we should hold off mm-hmm. for a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my first time back on set was June 15th, which also I think happened to be the very first day of the phase two reopening in New York. Right. But from that period, so my situation is a little different because not everybody can do this. I have uh, savings right. and I was still working on projects from home, not for that client, but I was still editing stuff or working on web design, you know, freelancing from time to time here and there. Um, you know, and there was some self-employment relief that, you know, mm-hmm. they gave you self-employment relief in New York, which is fantastic, you know. Right. Um, okay. So, but I wasn't really sure. I used uh, the first, like two, three months to just kind of like recharge a little bit, recenter, mm-hmm. refocus. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do I want to do with digital marketing? What do I want to do with this and that? Like, and I just started asking a lot of myself, a lot of self reflective questions, like trying to be more introspective about everything that I want to, how I want to take 2020 and on. Um, but as far as like surviving, it's, uh, it's, I'm fine. But like for other people, like if you want to be in New York, as a filmmaker. Um, it's funny because my perspective is from the perspective of a, of, of a pandemic. So I wish I had mm-hmm. more insight uh, living here with, without the affliction of this dang virus. <laughs> um, so um, if you're moving here, if you're single or if you're not single or whatever, um, you can always room with roommates. Uh, that keeps it cheaper. If you're in the city, roommates is a really good call. So that way you can, you know, mitigate your expenses. Uh, also, if you don't have a car, being in the city is fine. If you have a car, you can look out of the city for like a single unit where you live on your own, but that becomes more expensive. I live in a single uh, bedroom apartment. I don't have roommates. Um, I specifically didn't want roommates. I wanted my own space, creative space. Uh, I just, I'm at the age right now where I just, I need that, mm-hmm. you know, I don't really mm-hmm. want roommates. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't matter either. You could be 30 and have roommates and still trying to make it. It's everybody's timeline is different. There's no right or wrong answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but surviving in, in New York as an artist, there's a lot of opportunities. And like, all you need to do is get here first and start networking and reaching out to people, have mm-hmm. some money in your bank. Um, if you're willing to room with strangers, mm-hmm. that's, you can do that. Um, you run the risk of not knowing what ecosystem and environment you'll be, which could affect your mental health, your creative energy, Mm -hmm. everything else. Um, so you don't know what you'll be walking into, but at the same time, just keep a mindful and just be mindful of it and keep, uh, keep your eyes open and see what else is out there if that doesn't work out for you. So roommates is one option. Um, networking is a huge thing, right? You just have to network. You have to reach out to people. Um, I didn't know. So I knew a lot more people in Florida than I do in New York. I didn't really know anybody. I have a a few friends, um, but I had to get my feet wet up here. You know what I mean? The competition is high. It's very saturated. There's a videographer every block. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, 
So the comp- the competition being high isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means there's work. There's a lot of work, but it means you're going to have to work harder to get it. And there's a lot of very talented professionals here. There's like literally celebrities and like hardworking professionals that are in the industry and have been in it for a long time. So there's different tiers. Um, so surviving here uh, hasn't really been honestly difficult, to be honest. Um, people always told me before moving here, they're like, oh, New York's um, – uh, it's it's a hard city to live in, you know. It's people can't make it. It's too difficult. And then when I moved here, I was like, uh, not not really, you know. The, like things kind of like shift when it comes to cost. Like you can go get a dollar slice. Pe- I was I was not joking about it because I'm not being I'm not making light of homelessness. Um, but I was saying like, man, like if anything bad were to happen to my life, I would want it to be in New York mm-hmm. because you can walk everywhere. There's cheap food on every corner. You can go in with a dollar and come out with food, and that's your lunch. Um, you don't need a car. You don't need car insurance. <laughs> you can like mm-hmm. I recommend having it, but if you you don't need it, mm-hmm. and you can room. Like it's really just like mitigating your expenses and keeping it keeping your life cost effective. So there's like you know how they say living amongst your meme their memes <laughs> your memes. Um, there's living amongst your means, and there's living too high above it. So like a lot of people, when they live amongst their means, their means aren't actually their means. It's like their means are $5 a cup of coffee a day, right? which right. I, I went and got two today before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's like what is like literally how you would if, – if there was like a Great Depression and you had to suffer but survive, what is that bar? Okay. Now, li- now raise the bar where you're above that comfortable and then – that's your means, not this. This is too high. This is not your means. This is your means, right? So uh, just being mindful of where you're spending your money, mm-hmm. what you're doing. Um, now, that's like – that's financial. But when it comes to like networking, what I did was I had already – I was already in talks with a couple of people here. I started following people on Instagram that I liked their work, cinematographers, other people, which did lead to me working with them and connecting with them. And the conversations are still going, which is great. Um, following people in New York, just being very genuine, you know, trying to network with them, comment on their work, share it. You build a relationship that way. That's how I built my relationship with every single person on Twitter, with you guys, Mm -hmm. the the Thursday, Thursday group, all of you Mm -hmm. literally just natural, organic. I follow, I like, I retweet, I make jokes, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't ask for anything. Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's just, it's a natural fluid friendship that just, Mm -hmm. you know, that flourished over time. So uh, for people that want to move to New York, I definitely recommend following other people within your field, in that city, sharing their work, connecting, um, and just don't be afraid to also DM people. Mm -hmm. You know, I DM'd um, my buddy John because he had, he was tweeting stuff about needing a videographer. He was like, man, I can't wait to find a videographer that really connects with my vision. Um, and that can like will be willing to like grow with me and work with me and shoot. And I went and looked at his work and I saw his work ethic. I have a criteria for working with people that I want to like grow with. Um, and you know that's a strong work ethic, that's talent, and you know there's so many variables that go into it. You know character, all these different things. And I was like, man, this guy really hits all my criteria. Let me DM him. Mm-hmm. So I hit him up. I was like, hey, you know I saw your tweets about like needing a videographer but not having a big budget. You know, forget about it. Don't worry. Let's just shoot. Let's work together. Let's connect. And like, literally, he was like, "Oh my god!" Like, I feel like the universe just like connected us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that led to not only a friendship, but us working on four projects, planning our next four projects, mm-hmm. talking about narrative filmmaking because he also has an interest in acting, filmmaking, things like that. And literally, it's it's usually just kind of been like that. Like, work on. I worked on one project for free. Right. Mm -hmm. Which led to another project, which led to paid projects, which led to more projects in that criteria, music videos, um, which led to me working with uh, Frankie on, uh, you know, uh, Marachi's music video. It was like an Afrobeats um, music video in Jersey. Mm -hmm. That was cool. You know, it was actually more of like a you know professional set, verified Mm artist. You know, he's a cool guy. It was a cool set. Um, But just literally that. So the one with. Frankie, the cinematographer, who's also director, 
that was me following him and we just he followed back and we were just connecting with each other commenting on each other's work and then led to dms and stuff like that right mm-hmm. there was other ones from free work that led to other people seeing their work hitting me up saying i want to shoot there's other ones where i reached out to people specifically saying i like your stuff i want to work you know what i mean so the work is there but also at the same time i feel like people need to be realistic with themselves because sometimes they'll they'll have a certain rate in their mind for what their their work and labor's worth um but then the portfolio doesn't match Mm -hmm. or the experience Mm -hmm. doesn't match like you're trying to catch up with videographers or people that are charging 100 150 an hour and you're like that's my baseline i can't go you know below that but it's like you've been doing this for like five months and six months or like a year and your portfolio is really not at that at that value or it's like not extensive you know what i mean uh you don't have the experience of the tools necessary or things to like justify that um but i can't tell somebody what their value and worth is but because i know sometimes people they like they struggle they're like john i'm not getting any work like people don't want to collaborate and like how do you tell them your portfolio is not that great you know what I mean? It's like it's a hard conversation, but you have to be real with yourself because I wasn't getting a lot of work before. My portfolio wasn't great. You know, I don't even really like my reel now. I want to re-edit it. I have to put together my work a little bit better. Um, you know, there's people's reels that blow mine out of the water, and their mine blows other people's out of the water. So it's like a, it's like a process. You got to keep going there. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that self-realization of saying, "Man, I think I need to be better." Maybe I'm not ready for this level, so let me be humble mm-hmm. and let me hop on other sets. Let me help people, you know, mm-hmm. like instead of trying to gather a bunch of people to come work on my film that are not expressing interest mm-hmm. because maybe my last short film wasn't enticing for them. They're like, uh, like you send them a link, you send them your reel and they see it and maybe it's not the best. Our work is always our best we're like oh my god i love my baby project Mm -hmm. you know it's like you 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 cradle it but like that's to us to other people we don't know how it'll be perceived so if you're reaching out to people and you want to make projects and you want to like gather like crew especially for free um to work on your project uh, a passion project and your last film or your reel doesn't is not incredibly enticing especially if you're not paying people it, it comes down to self-realization that, okay, I need to help other people hop on their set. What can I do for you? Hey, let's, let's connect. Let's work together. That's what people did to me. They hit me up. They're like, Hey, I'd love to connect with you. Uh, just moved to New York. I'm like, Hey, me too. <laughs> you know? So it's like, we're in the same boat. Um, uh, but yeah, having that understanding that, okay, where am I in my career? Am I at, like, why am I not getting as much traction as I want? Um, even if you are the most talented and your real looks at, sometimes people just aren't really putting in the initiative. Mm-hmm. So there's like so many fluctuating variables. You could be talented, putting in the work, talented, not putting in the work. You could be not the most talented, putting in the work, which is amazing still. And you could be not talented and not putting in the work. So it's like, yeah, what's your, I have a question for you though. Like what's your view on like talent? Cause I have mine, but like, do you think you can, are you like just like cause some people say you're either born with it or you're not. You have no, the eye or you no, don't. No, no, no. That, 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 that doesn't – I don't think that really exists. I think there's certain people that are like – are able to pick up on things faster because of the way they grew up and like the way their brain is kind of trained. Um, yeah. It comes into like it, – it plays in the same way like in – for instance, in I think – this generation will be able to pick up things faster than the previous generation simply because yes. uh, the way new technologies come in and keep coming in and like you're constantly like, oh, I need to learn how TikTok works. Oh, I need to learn how like this works. Oh, I need to learn how this yes. works, right? Um, and so then something, when something like you're like, oh, I have to learn how to like make use of this camera or learn this new technique, you'll, you'll be able to do it faster because your brain is constantly used to like adapting into something um so there's people like that but i don't think i don't think talent in itself is something you're born with i don't think so either like i I, some people probably have maybe a little bit of a head start probably but right right and 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 that's what i mean like for instance if if you're like if we're both film directors for instance right narrative film directors and your dad uh 
has shot like three Oscar winning like films, the, uh-huh. you're going to have a head start than I am. Right. Just by nature of, of, of what it is. Right. Because like you'll like you'll know how the process works. You'll know that like, oh, you need to do this and this in order for it to be well. And to be honest, you might be able to get like better cinematographers to be on your set, better uh, editors because you have certain connections. Right. Um, exactly. Right. Um, but I don't think like talent is is something like that and what's funny is like uh when you were talking i, I was thinking about like th- this kind of like model that i kind of live by which is like um and especially in the narrative in the narrative field because so many like every project of yours is so close to you because it's like it's part of like what you feel right it's like it's like what you're kind of going through it's like um yes especially depending on how personal it is right and my kind of mentality is if you're like role model or the person that you look up to as a filmmaker kind of looks at your project and goes like that's terrible right your next thing should be like well how do i how do i make it better not like yes like because you can very much easily especially when you start off and when someone doesn't like your project you it feels like they don't like you uh Right. Right. Yeah. And people take it way too personal. And and I get it. Like I used to I used to do the same thing. Um mm-hmm. and I think there's a difference between like like someone not giving you good feedback versus someone yes. like like giving you good feedback but it's just not what you wanted to hear. Um, there's critiquing and constructive criticism. You know what right. I mean? Right. And and I think that like like my mentality has always been like I need to even though sometimes it hasn't been always apparent it's something that i strive for it's like i need to like make sure the something the thing that i'm truly like almost like proud of is like my work ethic Mm -hmm. and the ability to like be like okay how do i make this better um versus Mm -hmm. like be like no i'm just like the best ever like this if Mm -hmm. if you don't like it you're wrong (laughs) right no right and honestly like i've come like i have come across people like that because it's like you can't tell me my project's terrible because I will tell myself first. Trust mm-hmm. me. And, you know, it's like I do that. I am literally my own harshest critic. People are like, dude, that was good. But the thing is, I know what I'm looking for. I know what I'm looking at. I know what was here and I know what I'm looking at and what how that translated and what didn't work what and what did. So I've been in a constant state. I'm very – I'm not cocky. I'm confident, right? I'm a confident person. So when I tear my shit apart, people are like, John, you got to be more confident. I'm like, no, I am. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm confident, but I'm trying to find the errors and my mistakes. I got to figure out all these things because it's only through my harsh criticism on myself. It's only through my own introspective qualities that I have gotten yeah. better. I have improved year after year, project to project. But there are people that – have not improved i and i I feel really bad i I actually like just went to go look you know a few weeks ago at one person that i worked with like literally like 2013 Mm -hmm. it's the same quality and content from 2013 Mm -hmm. and i'm like ah man like if you're at martin scorsese or spielberg level and your quality and content's the same that's fine (laughs) you know but if if you're not there if it's still it almost feels like C level work mm-hmm. at best. Mm-hmm. That's not okay. What's you know? what's really interesting, and before uh, before we kind of wrap up this podcast, is this mm-hmm. video that I saw from from TEDx, uh, their animated section. Uh, yeah, it, it's such a fantastic video because it kind of applies in every life. Which it talks about this like psychological uh, behavior in people that are uh, adequate at best at things. And if you've seen it, what essentially happens is like uh, the people that are actually really good at things will always put themselves in like, will always consider themselves to be adequate. And the Mm -hmm. people that think they're really good are usually people that aren't. Yes. Uh, It's because, and this is not like, ooh, like, like, um, it's not like, like a random thing. This is like very logical in the sense that like if you are really good at something for instance mm-hmm. if i if if i'm like really good at let's say call of duty for instance right mm-hmm. that means i know about people that are usually going to be better than me and i know mm-hmm. like because i i can kind of see more 
about like where the scale is and I understand it more, then it means I know where I fall more. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know that in the larger perspective, I'm really not that great. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. at best, for instance, mm-hmm. um, versus someone that like, like maybe he, maybe he just started playing and he thinks he's really good. And he's like, oh, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm fantastic because he doesn't, he doesn't see the scale and that's just call of duty. And it's same thing applies with like filmmaking. It's like, it's like hum, being humble is such a big thing as a result. Right. It's like always mm-hmm. like, it's like you always need to, uh, like, I think people that are overconfident are the people that end up like 10 years down the line are still doing the same thing because they yes. think they're incredible uh, without trying to like sit back and look at the scale of like, ooh, like how do I get from, how do I become like this? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I combine my mathematical world and my creative world. Mm-hmm. I'm highly analytical as an individual, but I also, I apply that to my creative process. There is a way to blend it all. So everything I do, I kind of do in formulas. Mm-hmm. I, I can't help it. Mm-hmm. The way my brain operates is very much variable driven, very much formula driven. X plus Y equals Z. This, this mm-hmm. leads to that. This is the reaction of that. I, that's something that's just inherent in me. So when I just feel like, I don't know, this is a very blanket, bold statement to make without any <laughs> type of like <laughs> case studies or data. Those are the best kind. <laughs> I just feel like people that, it's not always the case, but people who are good at math somehow are always good at life. I don't even mean about money, just about understanding things because the way people's brains it's, operate. It's that people that are, are logical. At, you're right. Um and I try to blend the emotion, the emotional and the logical and just have a good harmonious balance between the two. Yeah. But yes, you're right. Yeah. It's pe- for some people whose minds are driven by, you know, variables, they understand things, yeah. how this clicks with that, how that doesn't click with that. And to people who are like that, when others are not like that, you're like, what is going on here? Yeah. You know, you want to like rip your brain out. You're yeah. like, <laughs> um, so yeah, to to your point on that, um, well, there goes my train of thought. I don't know where that. Where that train <laughs> <is going. laughs> um, no, I I think I don't. I agree. I think that like people that are logical are people that are able to try. Or e- even if you're, even if you're not like fully logical, the attempt at trying to be logical means it's the attempt at trying to see something outside the current uh, emotion of it, right? Like trying to step away right. from that for a second and be like, yes. well, what's really going on here, right? Yes. And then make a decision as a result. Uh, you have yeah. to have an out-of-body experience mm-hmm. when it comes to that. So a lot of times when I tell people, some people don't believe me when I say I can be emotionally unbiased in a situation that negatively impacts me when I make uh, choices. They're like, you can't because like it involves you and it affects you. I'm like, no, I, I can. I can remove myself from the bias of something that will in fact harm me or impact me negatively and have like an out of body bird's eye view, like a godlike view of everything that's happening. And I remove myself and I see this is what's happening. And this is what doesn't need to happen. Let's go this route, even if it affects me, you know, because like that's you have to be logical that way. Mm -hmm. You have to make certain decisions that uh, positively affect you and at times will negatively impact you. But that's just what it is, Mm -hmm. you know, and that goes to the point of be real with yourself as a filmmaker. Where are you in your career? Where like I tell that to myself all the time. It's like I'm not a feature film director because I'm not ready to be a feature film director quite yet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, you've got people like Ryan Connolly hasn't done his first feature yet, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean he's not able to, he can't, I'm sure if you want to do a feature right now, he could just do it. He's working his way up to that point by doing numerous shorts, by connecting, networking, things like that. I'm trying to do the similar, for like mold. I want to make more shorts. I haven't done as many shorts as I should have. Mm-hmm. And as I wanted to, mm-hmm. that's my fault. That's nobody else's fault. That's no, um, uh, no government. Well, maybe it's government a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my brain went no, no, to no. Uh, tax incentives no, no, in know, Florida. What were we talking know, about yesterday? Know, so, um, it, it's entirely my issue. I didn't network as much, mm-hmm. right? Because I have a problem 
uh, an internal problem with networking because I don't want to come off as disingenuous. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, but that's literally the whole point of networking is you, you each have something to benefit one another. Mm -hmm. It is, a, it is business first when uh, on your approach and that's mm -hmm. okay. If it turns into a friendship, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love that when that happens, if it doesn't, that's okay. But the entire nature of networking is to network for business and opportunities. So the way I'm wired, I view life, money, success, all these things very differently because I view a, a, a dollar bill the same way as I view a screwdriver. To me, it's all a tool. It's just, it just gives me the access to do what I need to do. I actually don't even care about money, mm -hmm. even though I like strive to have a lot of it. Um, but it's simply just to make things happen that I need to make happen before I go. Um, so uh, I all, I've always had a problem with like networking because I just like feel I'm very – personable i'm a very like lax guy actually most of my film my friends have never really been filmmakers mm -hmm. they've been they've been creatives or non-creatives but they've been they haven't been really filmmakers like mm -hmm. my closest friend's not a filmmaker he's a chef mm -hmm. you know what i mean so it's like there's a, there's never been this dynamic where people needed something from me in my circle and i needed something from them mm -hmm. to better our projects I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having your, your circle entirely be filmmakers. I'm just saying I wasn't used to that. Mm -hmm. And now I actually have more filmmaker friends mm -hmm. and I never want to come off as I'm using you no, because yeah. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't use anyone. I don't, you do need people to make a film. So when I say I don't need anyone, that's both true and not true. But at the same time, it's like this paradoxical thing. It's like, yeah, you don't need anyone, but at the same time you do need people. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I don't know how you balance that out no. like when it comes to like networking. I, it's it's, it's just – it's experience and stuff, right? I think that um, – it's fascinating because I think this conversation can go on for like ever. What are we at now? We're at an hour and oh. a half. Um, and I, whatever, whenever you want to end it, no, 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 yeah. no. I, I, I love it because I think that like yeah. it just – it's it's it lays the groundwork for anyone watching to then – keep thinking about it. Right. And I think that, um, I think that both of us are also people in, in the social media spaces that are like always willing to have these kind of conversations with people, um, just to kind of like share our kind of experiences and hopefully help people to make, uh, better decisions, um, as a result. Right. Uh, but Absolutely. I think that this is a really great place to end it because, um, it is like it was like a train of thought that I think is really good open ended in a, as, as a result, because I like when people like then start a conversation and uh, yes. and then and then like people will message me and then we'll have conversations about like stuff that we brought up in the podcast and and other Next things. Plus Y equals Z. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like what you said that about the social media, though, because um, I do like the conversation we had. It was very um, uh not in the middle in a bad way, but it was like, this is good, but this is also good, but this can be bad, mm -hmm. but that can also mm -hmm. be bad because mm -hmm. on Twitter, you've seen it. You can have a lot of, Oh, this is terrible. You mm -hmm. should be doing this. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, yeah. you can literally go any route you want. What yeah. are you talking? There's no mold. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, Twitter brings up, where can people uh, follow you on the social spaces? What, what, what oh do you, God. what do you prefer? I should have I should have had all my usernames the same. Literally, <laughs> I'll, everyone's different. I'll, 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 I'll link your stuff, but if you if you want yeah. people to like focus on one, just yeah, just find me on Twitter. I um I've been slowly phasing out every other social media platform except Twitter. So um yeah, find me on Twitter, uh, John Dang. That's X H O N Dang. Uh, you can find me on there. You can connect. We can chat about film or you know pretty much anything. Send memes to each other. So brilliant. Uh, and uh, and I'll link all his other stuff, uh, his YouTube. Yeah. And anything else that he wants oh, in in the description. You can also find me on Twitter and uh, and all the other social spaces. Twitter, it's Fanatic Express. Uh, YouTube, it's the Connie Project. Uh, I'll 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 put all of them in the in the description yeah. of either the if you're if you're hearing this in audio form, then it'll be in like the Spotify description. If you're if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then it'll be in the YouTube description. All right, listeners, if you guys haven't watched. Kizzer's latest short film. Please go do that. Uh, if you're if you're a supporter of his podcast, go support <laughs> that film because it is awesome. And he just released the art and the poster for it, which looks even cooler. That that was really cool. So um, that's the takeaway from this conversation. Go watch his latest short film, and I appreciate you having me on. Bro. Thank you so much, uh, dude. That's a that, that's a really nice shout out. <laughs> yeah, I just got to do it. It's like 
Go watch it. <laughs> All right. Take oh. care, guys. Peace.